All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started then. Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Peter Murray, and I'm the open source community advocate at Index Data and the host for today's event. Uh, our topic today is a panel discussion, a peek inside open source communities. Uh, today's session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. Uh, as an open forum, uh, participants can see each other and all of the questions submitted, and we've muted everyone except the speakers uh, to ensure good sound quality. Please do use the question box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come to you, and I will ask them of our panelists. If you like to tweet, uh, please use the hashtag Folio Forum. Uh, we also can uh, encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Today's speakers have a wealth of experience in open source projects, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, uh, say uh, what institution gives them a paycheck, uh, and which open source communities they're a part of. Uh, Paula, would you like to start us off? Certainly. I'm Paula Sullinger. I'm Associate Dean for Information Resources at Texas A&M University, and I'm here representing Folio. Uh, Kathy, how about uh, you next? Hi, I'm Kathy Lucier. I'm the coordinator for the Massachusetts Library Network Cooperative, which is a um, co cooperative of library consortia using the Evergreen um, ILS. And um, I'm active in the Evergreen community as um, a core committer to the project, as well as the chair of their outreach committee and a former release manager. Welcome. Thank you. I and Chris. Hello, I'm Chris Halberg. Uh, I'm a library technology developer at Villanova University, where I am one of the two core developers of Find the open source discovery layer software. Great. Uh, we're ex expecting uh, two other panelists. Uh, one just uh, popped in. Rosalind, uh, we just uh, were doing introductions. Uh, could you tell us uh, who you are, who gives you a paycheck, and uh, what open source communities you're a part of? Um, yeah. Sorry, my phone just decided to go on private. <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> so my name is Rosalind Metz. I am the Director of Library Technology and Digital Strategies at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so I oversee all of library technology for um, all of the libraries at Emory. Um, I am part of the uh, Samvera and Fedora communities but I am supposed to be representing Fedora. However, if I'm noticing Aviva's not here yet. Not here yet, yes. So she may be in meetings. Um, <laughs> so I can also answer questions about Sam Barrett until she shows up. Um, I'm on Fedora Steering and Fedora Leaders. Um, those are elected positions. Um, I was elected to Fedora Leaders and then elected to Fedora Steering. Um, the community, for those of you who don't know anything about Fedora, Fedora is a uh, repository management solution that many other communities build on top of, including the Semvera community and the Islandora community. Um, and since I still don't see her, the Semvera community <laughs> is also an open source community um, that uh, builds Ruby on Rails applications. Um, on top of Fedora, um, Solar, um, and Blacklight. Blacklight is also an open source product. Um, Aviva and I are both partners. Um, Aviva, uh, just to give you an introduction to her when she shows up, Aviva is um, one of the product or, or um, project directors for the Avalon Media System. 
um, which is a Simvera um, based solution for audiovisual materials. Um, our involvement in Samvera right now is actually both Aviva and I are pretty heavy. Um, I am one of the facilitators for the Samvera governance group. Um, so Samvera is looking at its governance model right now. Literally, as we speak, I had to remove the document from my screen. Um, <laughs> and uh, Aviva is a member of that governance committee as well. Great. Uh, thank you for the introductions. Uh, I've got some uh, questions uh, that I'd like to ask. Uh, th this, the idea for this uh, panel uh, came out of a, a discussion in the Folio community, wondering about how uh, other projects uh, structure their decision making, uh, how they in include all sorts of people, uh, how they, they market themselves and so forth. Uh, and you know that that uh, uh, the the need to kind of gather that information uh, is what prompted us to reach out to uh, other open source projects, and we thought, hey, this would be a a great idea for a uh, uh, an open discussion, a, a panel discussion of, on these topics. Uh, so, like I said, I have some questions. Uh, I encourage uh, the attendees uh, to uh, please use the, the question and answer box uh, as we go along. Uh, if something, uh, if a question I ask or an answer uh, from one of our panelists uh, prompts uh, a, a question in your mind, uh, uh, feel free to ask that. Uh, but I did want to get started by uh, asking our, our panelists uh, how your project is structured and and how you uh, how your the projects that you're affiliated with uh, go about making decisions and feel free to jump in okay i'll jump in <laughs> or i call on you but so thank you rosalind um so uh fedora's membership um is uh, or Fedora's leadership is based on DuraSpace's membership model. So um, DuraSpace has, I think, its platinum, gold, silver, bronze membership models. Um, and Murray pays in at the bronze level, so that's one of the reasons I'm elected. So I compete for a position on Fedora Steering along with other bronze members. Um, the steering is then selected from amongst the leaders and that steering group makes decisions on budget um, uh, strategic higher level strategic direction so right now we're having a conversation about resourcing for the project um, do we do we have um, the two full-time staff members are they meeting are they meeting our needs um, for the project? Um, that isn't meant to be a criticism of the staff members, but do we need more resources or different resources, that sort of thing. Um, so that's uh, generally how Fedora governs itself. The leaders meet on a regular basis, usually around the DuraSpace Summit, which tends to be at CNI. Um, so in April, there will be another DuraSpace Summit and we'll have another meeting of the group. We also have um, leaders has a regularly scheduled, I think it's bi-monthly meeting. Um, and then steering has a monthly meeting. I think that's, I, I'm in a lot of meetings for Fedora. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then oftentimes those group groups will then break off to do separate work. So for example, I just pulled together a um, committee to review this in the Fedora Code of Conduct. Um, so DuraSpace has a Code of Conduct, but we wanted to do reporting procedures specifically for Fedora members. So if they're at an event like Fedora Camp, they knew how to do reporting. Um, there are also other um, ways that um, other types of um, offshoot groups that both leaders and steering have. We also have recently been doing um, co-conversations with um, the technical group. So leadership and 
the technology, the developers for Fedora have been getting together to have conversations um, to hopefully foster more conversation between leadership and um, and the the developers themselves. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, our uh, final uh, panelist has uh, come into our, uh, our webinar here. Uh, Aviva, we've all gone around and introduced ourselves and uh, who we work for uh, and what uh, projects we're associated with. Uh, Rosalind did a, a, an excellent job uh, as, as your proxy, uh, but I, <laughs> I did want to give you a, a, a chance to uh, introduce yourself and and we had just started with the uh, question of, of how your project is structured and how decisions are made. Sure so uh, thank you everyone I'm really sorry that I'm late uh, I time zones are hard. Apparently. Uh, time zones are hard yeah. yes. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Aviva Weinraub I'm the Associate University Librarian for Digital Strategies at Northwestern University uh, which Rosie I'm guessing has already told you about me. Um, I uh, do work primarily with the Fedora community, the Sanvera community, and I'm the co-project director for the Avalon project, which is um, an AV, an open source AV system that is uh, uses both Fedora and Sanvera. Um, so I believe the question is, how do we do decision making for the community? Yeah, how your project is structured and, and how are decisions made? Sure, so um, one of the things that the Sanvera community is actually going through right now is a governance uh, restructuring. And part of that is actually around how do we make decisions and where do decisions get made? Um, currently, we do have a steering committee that is uh, made up of some of the core groups of, of individuals who started the San Vera project once upon a time, um, and then other people who have brought on board who have been brought on board since then. For the most part, uh, that group is primarily responsible for making uh, sort of legal decisions for the organization. Um, mm -hmm. They're not really supposed to be doing a lot of the more technical decision making. There, there has been, an, and this is really sort of why we're going through this governance restructuring, uh, some confusion about who gets to make decisions and who defines roadmaps and um, where do we go if there's a question about something. Um, and so a lot of it has been kind of this organically grown up community and we're really at this kind of turning point where we are recognizing that we need more structure, we need more decision making capabilities and we need to have the right people identified to do that. So uh, that's sort of a long winded way of saying that we're, we're in the process of rethinking a lot of how we make decisions um, and we're doing that work in a really community focused way. So we're reaching out to people, all of our notes are, are public and in the open. Um, we have documents out that we, are, we ask for feedback on, there's conversation about that there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are to some extent really consensus driven. Um, we are trying to find a, a path that makes everybody as happy as possible um, mm -hmm. while still really allowing for as much flexibility as we can moving forward. Great, thank you. Uh, Paula or uh, Chris? Uh, I'll happily jump in. Uh, so View, uh, View Fund is, as I mentioned before, has two core developers, myself and Damien Katz. Uh, we are both full-time employees of the library here at Villanova University, which covers basically all of the costs of uh, maintaining the software. So um, we're in charge of most of the work that gets done and like the day-to-day -day decisions on how things get done. But we do have bi-weekly dev calls that are open to anyone who wants to come and listen or contribute. Uh, and they're usually attended by about our usually like we have about a dozen very active contributors, but we have had probably 100 overall contributors throughout the project. Um, so those are open and happen every other week to, to kind of steer like those next two weeks of what's a priority, what's not, what was a really big problem, what's a very little problem. Mm -hmm. um, but the overall direction of the project is determined annually at our summit. There is a summit here at Villanova University every year. And then lately there's been a sister conference in Germany that's put on independently, but usually around the same time around do you find the very same thing. And together between those two conferences, we try to intermesh them together to create a roadmap which guides the next year and usually picks the direction for the next major release. Um, a lot of our contributors are from 
Europe because most of our adoption is in Europe and Scandinavia, um, which is why there's a conference over there. And the main reason for that is a lot of libraries in the Scandinavian er uh, area took ViewFind and added a bunch of common features to it that they all wanted, which is a version of ViewFind called Beluga. Um, and a lot of our contributions, our pull requests on GitHub come from features that they've added to Beluga that they want to contribute back to the ViewFind core. Mm. So Damien and I are mostly in charge of what goes in and when, and we are both in charge of when pull requests are accepted and whether or not they meet the quality, uh, the code qualities that we like. But the overall community does most of the steering and a very large portion of the contribution. I do want to ask at some point uh, about uh, international or, or beyond nation borders, uh, uh, how, to, how that process is managed. Uh, but I, I, I want to give uh, Paula and Kathy uh, and, uh, a chance to answer this question as well. Okay. Well, as I think everyone knows, Folio is still a work in progress. Um, so. I'm going to start from the, the bottom levels. Um, we have somewhere between 60 and 70 developers now, and they're uh, organized into functional groups. So there are different teams working together, spread out uh, internationally, mainly Europe and North America, I believe, right now. And for each functional area that's being worked on, there is a product owner assigned who kind of keeps tabs of, of what's going on and concurrently, there are also special interest groups from the library side that are also divided into functional areas. I believe we have about nine going right now actively. Um, metadata management, for example, which is looking at cataloging issues, resource management, acquisition, payment, um, resource access, which is uh, circulation, ILL. So um, they get together and um, uh, talk about what they need, discuss what the developers have been working on. Um, yes or no, is that gonna work? Does that look good? Um, each of those SIGs has a convener who um, gets the meetings together and the product owner for each function is the bridge between the SIG the librarians and the developers. There's very little um, direct interaction, but um, the product owner keeps things going. Uh, yes, this is what the librarians are expecting. Um, uh, above that is the product council, which has uh, members from the main um, uh, SIG members. I think we have well over 100 now, Peter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And, yeah, total of all the SIGs, yeah. Yes, okay. Um, so above that is the product council, which uh, is made up of representatives from the major stakeholders, not, not all of them, um, EBSCO, index data, and um, the libraries that are most intensely involved, mostly the OLA libraries. And it's our job, I serve on the product council representing Texas A&M, and it's our job to kind of keep all of that coordinated. We uh, we are in charge of the roadmap, uh, the priorities, what needs to be worked on. Uh, we try to make sure we have enough developers, enough product owners. And there are a couple levels above us. There's a steering committee and there's a board. But as far as um, daily um, uh, development work, uh, it gets done in the SIGs, the developers, and somewhat by the product council. Great. Thank you. Uh, we seem to be evolving a protocol here, interestingly, in our webinar, and, and that is uh, 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 if you have something that you want to add to this, uh, uh, unmute your microphone and, and uh, uh, I'll know not to uh, uh, go on to the, to the next question. Uh, so Kathy, uh, uh, thoughts on uh, project structure and, and how decisions are made? So for the Evergreen community, we have an executive oversight board that's elected, um, and they're mainly in charge of um, protecting the community's assets and oversee things like the conference planning, um, the small budget that we have, and, as well as our outreach out efforts. Um, as far as what kind of development gets done for Evergreen or the documentation, that's all done um, 
by the community at large. So there's a developer community and really it's up to a developer to decide, you know, if it's something they want to work on a feature or a, um, you know, an organization to fund it. Mm -hmm. um, and when the code is contributed, we have a about 10, I think, active core committers, which they're the only, they have, they're the only people who can actually uh, merge the code into our code base. So, um, you know, the code gets contributed, but there has to be at least one core committer to review it and mm -hmm. uh, put it in there. Um, a lot of our decision making happens at our, when we get together at our annual conference. Um, the developers usually meet there as well as other working groups. Um, and then we also have an annual developer hack away where a lot of the strategic discussions can happen. And, and other things might just get started on the list. So librarians are heavily involved on our list and, you know, um, starting discussions there might lead to uh, discussions at developer meetings where um, action is taken. Mm. Great. I, I want to return to this, this uh, uh, question about international uh, participation and, and uh, Chris, that, that observation about viewfind, you know, starting on the, the uh, east coast of, of the United States uh, and then getting picked up in, in Scandinavia uh, by a, 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 what it sounds like an active uh, development team there. Uh, can you talk about how that came about and, and how over time the, you, you've integrated their work and, and uh, their discussions, their priorities into the project as a whole? Um, I'm pretty sure the adoption of Viewfind in uh, Europe and in Scandinavia happened before I was part of the project, so I can't exactly say how that got started, but they've always been very generous with their their time and their code. Mm. Um, they've never, there's never been an issue of like, oh, can you please contribute back like features? They're always more than willing to like provide design ideas, come to the conference, even the, um, come to the summit, even the one all the way here in Villanova. Mm. Um, so it, they've always been very generous with their time. They're active on the email lists. So it wasn't really ever a question of, okay, now that we have this audience that's using our, pro our, our product, how do we get them to contribute back to the project? They've seemed to immediately understand that the nature of our open source project was when you use it for free, if you do something really good with it, please contribute it back. And I think one of the, the um, features of Viewfind um, is we kind of have like a kitchen sink setting like philosophy where whenever features are recommended or pull requests are made, we our usual response is that sounds great. Let's just make it a setting. So if you don't want it, you can turn it off or, and there's usually a discussion about whether something should be off by default or on by default, but for the most part, everything is welcome. And I think that's one of the things that allows us to have such an active community is that it's really easy to contribute to the project because even a small little change, like I think these buttons need to be more accessible. Um, and we get pull requests. We're working on one right now that shows just a little bit more book information on holdings. And it's something that we're giving feedback to. And it certainly creates a welcome um, environment that if you have anything to contribute, the contributions are welcome and ready. Um, as far as collaborating internationally, we try to have our the bi-weekly dev calls early in the morning because they are later in the day than us over there. So it's usually around 8.30 in the morning with, and even with the time zone differences when we're in daylight savings time and they're in daylight savings time, because those are at different times. Mm -hmm. It tends to work out well that it's comfortably in the morning for us and in the afternoon for them. So normally the work time usually overlaps. We don't have as many people contributing from other time zones. So it tends to be a five or six hour difference ahead, which is very useful. Uh, if we did go a little more global though, we might have to put a little bit more thought onto when we time and have these things. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, from a, from yeah. a, uh, an open source project that is very global because <laughs> we have people in Australia, there is no good time. <laughs> mm. So somebody is always going to have to be staying up either super late. Um, our Australian participants, because um, we have two on the Fedora um, leaders and steering calls, um, they are often sending, I'm so sorry, 
my calendar didn't warn me, which I also think may mean my alarm didn't go off. Or, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the few times that I've been responsible for scheduling meetings, I try to like do it like 8 a.m. their time, which ends up being like four or five our time. Um, and some people get frustrated with that, but uh, often, you know, I feel like they're staying up late, so you can stay till six o'clock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for the I, team. I, um, unrelated to the project per se, but having uh, done a lot of collaborations with people in Australia, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, there is no such thing as a good time. Um, and it's hard when you're having those kinds of standing meetings to move them around because people sort of, you get used to having a specific time on your calendar. And I think to some extent what, what we've done in the Fedora community is really say the majority of users are in North America and Europe. We're going to find a time that meets their needs as best we can um, and fill in our colleagues on the other side of the world, which is not fair. Um, and to Rosie's point, you know, there is that sort of desire to move things around. But again, those standing meetings make it hard to do that. Um, and so, you know, you, you just sort of hope that your notes are good enough and that people feel like they can contribute with email conversations. And that's a lot of how we end up doing work is either via, via Slack or via email um, and people get to engage that way. So that sort of offline asynchronous uh, communication pathway, especially for your international partners is key because otherwise there's no way to make sure that their voices are heard. And I think the other thing is that the sort of local communities that work together. So if there's a group in Australia, if there's a group mm -hmm. in a particular area that those groups have a chance to work together and talk to each other. Um, and so at least there is some sort of community in that, at least in that local sense. Mm -hmm. And we're definitely seeing that kind of local thing in Scandinavia, in Norway, and and Sweden in particular. I guess that's all that's Scandinavia defined. But mm -hmm. um, but like their ability to work together and have a, a like their own core on top of Viewfind really helps them uh, adopt and has really helped us spread in that area where we haven't been spreading as um, as quickly uh, domestically. So. So for Folio, the uh, developers seem to be handling this pretty well. I think they're used to the asynchronous. Uh, a lot of things get gets done on Slack. Uh, on the librarian SIG side, we don't work that way. And um, our main contributors are Europe and North America. So, um, and most of the American institutions involved are on the East, East Coast, the Eastern time zone. So meetings tend to be um, mid-morning for them and mid to late afternoon for the Europeans. For the two of us in the central time zone, it looks like a very early morning. Uh, what they think is a 9 a.m. meeting is um, 7. We're starting to get participation from Colorado. Uh, that's looking at 6 or 7 a.m. for them. If we ever get serious interest from California, I don't know what we're going to do. Um, hate to ask someone to get up at five in the morning. Um, and we know we have interest from Australia, but we have not been able to work that out yet um, for serious participation by them. And we're largely um, North America, so most of our meetings take place um, afternoon Eastern time zone, which is morning for the West Coast. Um, but we do have um, users around the world um, and we do we have a really active group in the Czech Republic and uh, one of the people from there is um, oversees our translations and she finds she does a lot of that through email on the list or contacting people directly and that seems to work I think if we expanded more in Europe or um, towards Asia or, or Australia we might need to rethink meeting times but for now this is seems to be working Great. Uh, so that you know, that's one the one dimension that we talk about uh, expanding uh, our uh, the the user base of, of our software, and, and that's you know geographic. Um, another one that's that's somewhat unique uh, to our field is library type. 
um, and you know, you know how do uh, how does a project that started in, in a public library space uh, attract uh, academic libraries and vice versa? Uh, and at, at what points does that make sense? And at what points are we talking separate projects or even forks of projects? Um, for Evergreen, I, we started uh, primarily um, for public libraries in consortia. So those are two different groups, but really early on in the project, uh, academics started using it as well as single libraries. So um, the use came long before we were, you know, long before even I was involved in the project. Um, but it's a discussion we do have a lot, and a lot of the discussion is around making sure that we have the features that these different groups need. Mm. Um, and I would say we've, they just, we just, had a meeting last week of our um, student success group, I think is what they're calling it. And it used to be an ac academic interest group that kind of um, stopped meeting for a while and is now starting to meet again. And so I, I think a lot of what happens when this group meets is they come up with features that would make it better for academics. But for the most part, they're things that are also useful for public libraries. Um, or things that a public library could find a use for. So a lot of it, what we've found is if we're improving the software for academics or for those single libraries out there, it generally improves it for um, all of our users. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, another part of that is really trying to get the word out that yes, academics can use this. And um, apparently that was uh, part of the discussion at the meeting last week is how, um, you know, maybe looking at ways to go to conferences where you find more academics and um, showing off evergreen there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Folio, the um, major participation is coming from academic libraries, a wide variety of sizes, um, major research institutions like us, smaller institutions, and a variety of consortia. There's um, a Boston area consortium made up of very small libraries. And um, we have two German consortia and I'm really not even sure how many uh, institutions are represented by that. We know there's interest from public libraries, but no one has stepped forward to actively participate. And um, we are really hoping we're developing Folio to be flexible enough to handle any kind of library. We, we don't want to be exclusively um, an academic library product. So there, there's a, you know, I, I think it, taking this even broad, more broadly than, than geography and, and library type, uh, there's the, the question of uh, how do projects that may have started at one institution uh, find their way beyond that that core uh, initial user base. Uh, you know, Chris Villanova has been uh, very supportive of Viewfind over the years. Uh, but how you know what does it mean to to? I, I guess the, the the question I'm asking is you know the the classic case of open source is something is developed and it's it's put up on GitHub or or Bitbucket or SourceForge or or something like that, um, but it, it takes a, a it, it seems to take a, an active effort to to get a community of users to 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 build on it. Uh, so how how do how do how do we do that, uh, Aviva? Um, so I'm going to not, I'm going to take off my Samvera and my Fedora hat for just a yeah. minute. And, um, yeah. so when I was at Oregon state, uh, Oregon state before I started there had created an open source project called library a la carte, which, uh, is an open source version of libguides or libguides, however you prefer to say that. Um, and it came out just a couple months before libguides hit the market. Um, and it was adopted by a number of institutions, but, but Oregon State had one developer on staff who was really maintaining the code, taking care of the code, releasing updates to the code. Um, and that really wasn't sustainable for the organization to be able to then continue doing other work, right? To, mm -hmm. to explore other areas that they wanted to explore. Um, and so we did spend about a year or so actually trying to build 
a community around that. So we said, okay, you know, other people are using this tool. How do we build a community? And, and we didn't actually, we were not able to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think to some extent, at least with that particular tool, there was another tool on the market that was relatively inexpensive. Um, and the majority of people had chosen to go that route rather than the open source route. And the institutions that ended up keeping it were saying, oh, well, we've already done all of this work. We just didn't know how to contribute back. And I think, you know, and, and at that point we had, you know, we had decided, okay, we're, we're leaving, we're, we're doing our own migration, et cetera. And I think that that in that particular case, um, part of it was that we didn't actually from the beginning say we want your feedback and this is how you can also help us and contribute it. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that Chris is going to have a, maybe a different thing with Villanova on that and, and I would and, and I would love to hear what he has to say on that, but I think it could be hard once you have a tool in place to then sort of switch to opening yourself up for that kind of feedback mm, and that kind mm. of contribution. Interesting lesson, yeah. It, it may surprise no one to learn that a, uh, a product called ViewFind, VU Find, is uh, Villanova University centric. Right. Um, it was an initially developed as our own search um, uh, system in like response to the commercial things at the time back in 2008. Back then, there was a lot of interest in having like something to compete with these com expensive commercial. Um, systems. So there was a lot of interest when we went open source with our solution. We quickly gathered a following that was local and has very spread very quickly. So attracting an initial um, group wasn't so much the issue. But uh, I think one of the things that still attracts people to Viewfind is our technology choice. Uh, Viewfind is built with PHP and is built on top of a popular framework called Zen Framework. And I think that's one of the draws that continues to bring people to ViewFind is a lot of the newer systems use Ruby on Rails or use Python or use different technology that is much newer, much more modern uh, and much more uh, popular these days. PHP has kind of become less popular in the face of these new technologies. But because we are continuing to use PHP um, and we use PHP throughout our, our whole system, um, the templating, the back end, everything like that. It, I think that's a draw for people who are already um, familiar with PHP. Already so, have those skills. Yeah, so in, uh, our initial drawing was mostly people were not very happy with the commercial options available, saw a free open source develop, like option. So when we did initially release it on SourceForge, we were looking for feedback. We were looking for a way to make it more general. Um, and we moved to GitHub I think like five years later, and that kind of helped create a community because GitHub is much easier to receive contributions than the SourceForge uh, was at the time. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, was there another aspect of the question that I haven't <laughs> covered? Uh, no, I, th I, th I, I okay. think you nailed it. Uh, <laughs> no, that, was, that was good. Uh, good, uh, good observations on, on both sides. Uh, so we are communities uh, of, of volunteers. Um, and uh, one of the, the challenges there uh, is the, the need to find balance uh, between the, the, the questions of, of uh, new and perhaps needy users uh, versus the, the time available from the volunteers of the community. Uh, how, do you, how do you get that balance? Or, or how, how do you work to achieve that balance? I can only speak for Texas A&M here. Um, we are heavily involved in Folio. I'm looking at a list of about uh, 20 people who are directly involved and um, none of their other work went away. Um, and some of these people are now spending two, three, four hours a week on it. I'm spending about 10 or 15% of my time. And we've just made Folio our priority. Um, we want to see it succeed. We want to be a part of the development. And what that really means is that there are a lot of other exciting projects going out on in the library world right now that we're saying, no, we can't get involved in. Um, we're having to scale back. Um, we'd love to be much more 
um, active in the linked data uh, environment, um, but we're just having to say no to other things until mm -hmm. till this is more mature. So um, kind of jumping off of what Paula said, within the Fedora community, one of the things, um, if you were to look at the list of um, leaders and steering, you'll notice that it's lots of R1 institutions. But the reality is that Fedora has, um, most of their installations are not for R1 institutions. Um, most of those in installations are with much smaller um, organizations. And I've, I've recently had conversations with folks who um, uh, work at um, smaller institutions, I'm using air quotes, um, primarily because Emory isn't that big. Um, if you look at its makeup in terms of students, it's, it is rather small. Um, but when it comes to financial situation and research dollars, we are pretty large because we have the CDC on campus um, and the library is named after the founder of Coca-Cola, so you know there's that. <laughs> Um, there's lots of Woodruff libraries in the Atlanta area. They're all named after the same man. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, you know, we, we end up taking up a lot of space as if we were a big institution. And, you know, what I've heard from my counterparts is, well, the R1s are making all the decisions for um, the, these open source projects, these open source communities. And, you know, I, I often think that having come at smaller institutions, I, I definitely hear what they're saying. But ultimately, I think the issue becomes a priority issue, right? Like what Paula was saying, she had to make a decision about what the library participates in. And so right now, I'm spending a lot of my time on Fedora and Samvera because we're in the process of building a digital library and it is the priority at our institution and so that's why I'm involved as heavily as I am because I know that is a priority for my institution um, and that isn't to say that I won't always be involved in those communities but it may also mean that I do scale back at some point when that isn't the priority for my institution Mm. Um, and maybe something else will come up and I'll say, okay, I need to drop Fedora steering, but I can remain on Fedora leaders or whatever. Um, so I, I hear what smaller institutions are saying, but I also think in some respects it is that the larger institutions have resources available to them to be able to contribute to those, insti those, those communities and whatnot. Um, and, and that's unfortunate, um, but we all have to make priority decisions in our lives, whether it be, am I gonna go out to lunch with Sally or am I gonna go out to lunch with Bob? Maybe I pick Bob today because I have 10 things to talk to him about, but I only have one thing to talk to Sally about, right? Mm -hmm. So everything kind of becomes a, what is the priority and how do I make decisions based on those priorities? which may have gotten away from your conversation, but <laughs> your question, but I think is a, a really important thing to bring up is that, you know, part of the reason that decisions are getting made is because, because of where priorities are lying and for institutions. Um, and for a smaller institution, it may just be, in, you know, there are certain things that they just have to prioritize and they can't contribute back the way that they would like to. It's it's a different type of balance. You were you were kind of addressing the 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 question of balance within an within an institution about how uh, uh, you contribute, uh, and I think that's an excellent question as well. Uh, so I you know I offer it to to our our panelists. You know we're speaking of of balance uh, either within the project. How does uh, how does a uh, a project uh, figure out how to address users on a voluntary basis, uh, but also how does it, how does the institution make uh, decisions about what's the appropriate balance uh, of of offering that volunteer time uh, at the institutional level? 
So one of the things that, that as we've been going through this governance process with Sambera that we've been thinking about a lot is as we start adding more and more cloud-based services and as we sort of move into this arena of moving away from having Sambera being primarily adopted by R1 institutions or wealthier institutions or resource-rich institutions, whatever term you want to use in that particular way, um, we are thinking more and more about how we make sure those voices are actually part of the conversation. So if you say as a consortium member, uh, end up using Sambero or you use Avalon or you use whatever, um, how do we make sure your voice is being part of the community? Is it that somebody from the consortia is then on various committees, do we say anybody within the consortia that is using the tool can join various interest groups? Um, you know, and there are lots of ways to contribute to a project that are more than just code, right? And we spend a lot of time talking about and focusing on, to some extent, you know, um, Rosie and I have had this conversation about sort of being developer led, right? A lot of these projects are led by the developers. Um, and, and when you get to a certain point, you really do need to to, to be a good sustainable project, you need to have other voices in that space. Um, and not just for prioritization, but for really thinking like, hey, how do I actually ingest my metadata into this, into this system? You didn't think about that because you were focusing on all of these other things. Mm. Um, and so there are ways for us to be able to make sure that, that those other voices are part of the conversation, contributing to the conversation, and ultimately pushing the agenda forward. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we are still a bunch of universities and, and uh, you know, research agencies in, in whatever way, shape, or form that are donating our, our time to these projects. And so it does have to match in some way with our institutional priorities. So again, you know, we do work on Samvera that, that ultimately is going to impact Avalon, but I will sometimes let my devs do work on something for Samvera that we know is not, is on our roadmap, but something we're not going to be actually worrying about for another year and a half. But mm -hmm. we'll do the work now because we know that in the, in the future, we have this, this sort of way forward. But that is a balancing act, right? I mean, I can't constantly have my staff working on stuff that's going to impact us in a year. I need to actually think about what's going to happen next. And I think Paula has her hand up, so I'm going to mute myself. Oh, I wasn't meaning to interrupt you. Um, again, I can only talk from the uh, A&M perspective, but um, Folio isn't our only open source uh, project. We are heavily into open source. Uh, we're part of Coral development. We're using Fedora um, as um, part of our um, development of a digital asset management system. We use Cronam from the Library of Congress. Uh, we use DSpace for our repository. So this is an institutional or um, a library commitment to open source. Uh, we're fortunate to have a healthy development staff and it, um, I think this conversation brings home that open source is definitely not free. Hmm. Uh, in fact, we're pretty much aware that our fully involvement initially mm -hmm. may cost more than going out and buying a system, but we think in the long run we'll be better off. Yeah, it's free I, like a kitten. Or free like a free puppy. It's. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I, I do that math all the time when I, when, I can, when I basically look at the amount of money it's costing my devs to work for one week on a project, I could say, well, you know, it might be cheaper for me to buy something, but it probably still won't have the functionality that, I, that I'm looking for, the flexibility that I want. Um, and there is a real value of actually saying we own this as a community, that this is ours and it doesn't belong to a vendor because these are our priorities and not their priorities. Um, mm. And I think that that is, for many of us, one of the key pieces of this is that actually being able to say, these are the priorities that we have. These are valuable to us. This is where we see our field uh, working, emerging, and engaging in that sort of 5, 10, 20, 50-year timeline. I think it's valuable for us to be engaged in these kinds of activities. And you know, and even if we're, we're doing projects that are similar to one another, um, I don't necessarily see them in that same competition space. Hmm. I think Aviva hit the nail on the head there too. It's um, from an institutional perspective, I know there are some evergreen institutions that have it in their job description that 
con contributing to the evergreen community is part of their job. Mm -hmm. And of course, the incentive for doing that is that that institution is going to see the software develop in a way that's beneficial to them. Um, and trying to educate um, different institutions about that, that, you know, screaming for a feature isn't going to be particularly effective, but, you know, putting some you know, hiring someone or making it part of someone's job description to work towards those things are, will certainly be more effective. Um, from a community standpoint, I think the other thing is having easy entry points for contributing to the project. I, I would say we have a lot of people who are interested in contributing, but they don't know where this to start. So we've done things, um, we borrowed this idea from the COA community of having these community bug squashing days. Um, mm -hmm which what's nice about it is people who are already involved but just have trouble getting time it's something they can bring to their uh, super supervisors and say here there's a day they've set aside for me to work on this and it's mm. something tangible they can bring to them to take that time but we also found because we were setting up um, sandboxes for people to be able to test bug fixes we we provided an easy way for people who hadn't previously been involved to go and test bug fixes and be able to say, say, hey, this works for me, or hey, this isn't, this needs a little adjustment. And, um, you know, it just created opportunities from, for some other people to get involved who hadn't previously been contributing. Uh, I want to remind our, uh, our uh, attendees uh, to uh, please use the, the question and answer box. Uh, if you do have uh, questions that uh, uh, come up as a result of this conversation, uh, please put them in there. Uh, I wanted to, to uh, uh, take off on something that uh, Kathy was saying, uh, working the, working on open source, actually putting that into a job description. Uh, have others uh, done that uh, either at, uh, at the individual level as, as in a job description or, or part of goals for a yearly review um, or even more strategically at the library level? Uh, have you done anything there and, and how has that worked out? At, uh, at Villanova here in the library, all the tech developers have the same job title and the same job description just to keep us all flexible. Um, there's only five of us. So like any task that comes up, one of us is going to have to handle it. We kind of figure out the roles internally. But definitely in our job like descriptions, like as far as like our evaluations and review and our, our formal goals for the year, year Damien and I both have as our top project viewfind. Um, and it, it's definitely kind of getting back into like, like the time spent on it is definitely an investment. And it seems like we're very fortunate that, that Villanova and the library see that all the time that we spend investing to make Vfind better is going to make our own search better because we use Vfind internally. So it, it's kind of a weird couple of situation where, yes, we're working on this open source software that is benefiting everyone globally and it's not always targeted at what we hear in the library need but it is improving what we use every day all the time that we spend on it um but the touch back on the last question real quick because there is only two of us there's definitely a bottleneck and balancing the priorities because mm. we find it's just one goal on our official write-up um we, we just had a small a small problem like a small crisis i guess not it didn't cause any major issues but i got pulled away to work on the deselection project to write tools here internally at the library and because i'm one of two developers and i'm the lead front end developer nothing got done on viewfinds front end for like two months hmm. and that's definitely a bottleneck and a, definitely a problem with the way that we're currently structured so as far it, it's definitely understood around here at the library that viewfind is our major ongoing project but there is definitely a priority that anything that happens here at the library takes precedence. And that's often not a, a, a hard choice to make, but occasionally it does create um, a, a resource divide. Mm -hmm. 
So I would say that that, that balancing act is uh, across the board. So when I came on board at Northwestern, one of the things that I said to my developer staff was that I expected them to engage in community sprints. And as I said just before, one of the things that, um, you know, that you are doing is you are sort of balancing this sort of this expectation that there are things you're going to work on that are not immediately going to benefit you, but that have long term impact or good for the community move the project in a particular direction. If you do X and then, then Y can happen, you know, four four steps down the road and that chess game is always in place. Um, mm. And balancing your local needs to the community needs are, you know, are, are, are always a balancing act. I mean, we have products that we have to get off the door and we have deadlines that we set for that. And then something comes along and somebody says, hey, there's a sprint on IIIF image, you know, something or other, let's do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, you pulled one of the developers off and then, oh, this other thing came up. And it's, you know, it's always going to be a balance. You do have to ultimately say, this is the priority for the institution. Um, and, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, I have, I, I don't do that anymore. I don't do that planning anymore. I, I sit on that strategy level. Um, but my, my staff spend a lot of time working on it. And so it's easy for me to say, I want you to spend X number of weeks a year doing these community, these community sprints. Um, and then I really sort of say to my staff, it's up to you to balance kind of where that goes. But um, I, I will take this opportunity to say that um, a really strong project manager is key to making your projects and to balancing things, to balance things both in that sort of community sense and that local sense it is key if you don't have somebody who's actually there to manage that for you um, and to be that layer to really do that planning to think to think forward like that with your staffing um, you're gonna you're gonna have problems and you're gonna have people that are really upset about feeling like their work isn't getting accomplished is that a project manager at, I, I, yeah i see you paula uh but i is that a project manager at the institution level or at the open source project level I would say actually to some extent both. Um, mm. I think having somebody locally to do that work for you to help you balance your local resources is imperative. Uh, but I, I, you know, again, one of the things that we've been talking about in Samvera is that we, we need to have a community organizer. We need to have a technical um, road mapping and technical planning so that we can do some of these things. We can plan sprints. It'll help with, um, you know, one of the big complaints that we've been hearing in our community is around churn, right? We have all of these new updates that come up in a year. If you have two to three major updates in a year, you know, a lot of institutions can't keep up with that. So how do we plan, how do we plan that more effectively so that we say we have, you know, three dot releases over the course of a year and one major release every year. And you can say, maybe we don't do the dot releases. We just do the big release. I mean, whatever you, you need to do internally to manage your schedule with the larger open source project, I think is valuable. Um, but I do think that you need it on both levels because there is a lot of coordination happening in both, in, in both places. I think also that it depends on the size of the project that you're working on. Um, I think if you're working on something that's a relatively small project, you may not have that much need for infrastructure, but I don't want to devalue the need for it because it, it's, it's, as you get to a certain point, it's really necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paula? You know, for Folio, we're just very fortunate that um, it's wider than just um, libraries um, and single institutions. We have uh, major commitments from EBSCO, Index Data. There are other um, commercial vendors involved in the project, um, Frontside, Colto, um, that are just coming forward to, um, some of them are being paid to help and some of them are just saying, hey, we see a niche where we could fit in and we wanna help with the effort. And uh, EBSCO is providing a lot of the structure that Aviva was talking about. Mm. Mm -hmm. So in, in Fedora, we have two dedicated staff members. Um, mm -hmm. We have a tech lead and then David um, Wilcox, who kind of is expected to do all the things. <laughs> uh, that's kind of where a resourcing problem is coming into play. Like, <laughs> it's unrealistic. Mm -hmm. David can't do everything. Um, and uh, um, at the local level, we do provide, um, or 
Fedora institutions do provide developers to the project. Um, and that may, who that is may vary. So I have no Java developers on staff today, um, but there are things that my developers can contribute to Fedora like testing. Um, and so one of my developers has been um, helping with doing some testing for the new API specification that Fedora is working on. And um, in terms of writing into his job description or into the developer's job description, what, um, whether or not they work on open source, I mean, to some respect, the only reason it's not in their job description is because I have HR won't let me. <laughs> um, so there is a software engineer job description and is shared across the university. So I can't write anything into their that job description. So I put in some preferred qualifications, like if you know Samvera, you know Fedora, you know Ruby, you know Rails, you know Java, like great, I'd love to hire you. Um, and that that in and of itself is its own challenge, like across the board. Um, but they know that that is what they're supposed to work on. Um, so most days, Colin, my lead developer, I know even on a weekend, I can probably find him in the Samvera Slack channel. I'm more likely to find him in the Samvera Slack channel than I am in our Slack channel. <laughs> um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, but uh, they are aware that that's what they're supposed to be working on and that's the community they're supposed to be working with. And yesterday we did phone interviews with um, a candidate for an open software engineer position. And that person had never worked in libraries before. So, you know, I was trying to explain Sinvera project and how libraries like to collaborate. And, and I said, so, you know, in some respects you will have Colin and um, my other developer, Zoe, as your colleagues, but you will also have, your colleagues will be people at other institutions as well. Ah, interesting. So, you know, you, you'll get to know those people, you'll have relationships with those people. It's not just who we are sitting in a room. I mean, obviously, right, because you're sitting next to them, it's easier, but mm -hmm. um, those are people that you also should consider your colleagues as well. That is kind of unique, isn't it? Uh, probably, probably important to bring up in a job interview that that the colleagues aren't just the people directly around you, but as libraries, we're kind of uniquely collaborative, or or I don't know, I don't know how unique it is, but uh, but the, setting that expectation that that there is something broader than the institution that that, that you're working for. So. Um, Related, unrelated, one of my uh, front end devs is um, a, the, a member of a, a relatively famous band, um, you know, international acclaim, world tours, et cetera. And, what, and when he started, oh, it's sort of funny how our, our profession ends up getting some of those people in it. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that he actually said when he took this job, you know, he, he, second day here, he came into my office and I said, I have this expectation, you're engaging in these communities, et cetera. Um, and, um, and he said, you know, I didn't really know. He's like, I always sort of, I coded in, in open source software, but I had never really engaged in the community side of things that had never been part of the work that I did. I just put my code up on GitHub and it was open. Mm. Um, and one of the things that he talks about is how, uh, for him, the, the open source library community is a lot more like the rock and roll community. Um, you know, it's this, these are the group of people that you're going to, you know, you're going to slack with in the middle of the night. You're going to talk to, um, if you're in a city, you know, you can crash on their couch sort of thing that, that there is a, a community and a friendship that comes from, from that, that your, your peers are not, your colleagues are not just the people who are sharing your office or colleagues are, are literally the entire community, which mm. I think is, is a really beautiful piece of this. Um, so. Uh, and if you're lucky, you get to do a 360 review for one of them, which I'm oh. doing for Viva. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that speaks to a lot, right? Because I, I sit on Fedora with Aviva. I'm sitting on a Sanvera governance group, group with Aviva. We have other things that we're collaborating on. We're not, you know, it started because 
well, it started because of the Digital Preservation Network, but that's a different story altogether. But, you know, the, that relationship stays and maintains and then, you know, more is kind of built on that, on that foundation. I mean, and I think you, earlier we talked about, um, you know, the, how did we expand to other libraries? And I kind of stayed silent because Fedora, um, it tends to be in the research library space and doesn't really leave. I mean, there are governmental research libraries and whatnot, but the reality is the Sambera community started because of Fedora mm -hmm. and the Islandora community started because of Fedora. So Fedora expanded in that now you, if you are in one of those communities, whether you like it or not, you are, <laughs> you are also part of the Fedora community. So we expanded by creating more communities. Um, and maybe if everybody else lasts like 20, 20 years, 25 years, I forget. Um, <laughs> you too can spawn your own community. <laughs> Fedora has a long history, yes. Yeah, yeah. so I think, um, you know, I think that's, that is an interesting thing in and of itself that, you know, you get into an open source community, you create relationships by the nature of the fact that you're working together and then more spins out of that. Um, it's not just, hey, I'm sticking to my bucket. I'm just doing my one community. There is a lot more to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will also say on the flip side of that, that I think that, um, because of the community that that does spawn from it, that it can seem to other to outs to others that are not part of that community, like there's a click, um, or that there's mm. a group of people, which I think you know is is the downside of having that strong community. And while I think nobody that's in the community would ever say, "Oh, we're exclusive," or "Oh, you're not welcome." It is very easy to see how, you know, Rosie and I have a strong relationship with one another because of those collaborations and it could easily look to other people like, well, you're not welcome because you're not engaged, which is not at all what we're trying to do and not at all what we're trying to say. Um, it's just that when you get to spend that much time working with people, you do build those relationships. But it is something that I think as these community-based projects develop is really important for us to think about um, how, how that looks to the outside. Because uh, mm. it, it, can, it can come across poorly, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and there's kind of almost like an, an, an addictive aspect to open source is that once you start contributing to open source, every tool you want to use that you're looking for becomes an open source tool. And so it was interesting we just we just uh, brought up hiring before is that we also hired um, we we're very fortunate to get two new tech devs in the past year and in both those processes we did look for open source contribution you know comfort with mm -hmm. github comfort with uh, version control software and so our new tech dev that's in charge of our digital library um, from the outside you wouldn't know that they're a digital library thing. You would think that they're working on and a, poor, a core part of the universal viewer development, which is an open source uh, IIIF uh, project. And while he is absolutely part of that team, that's not his job. It just improving the digital library became intrinsically involved with improving this open source tool. Mm. So even when it comes down to like, oh, we need an inventory to see how many laptops we have, we just go on to GitHub and look up open source tools. It becomes the thing that it's, it's almost a viral sensation that once you start using open source tools, especially contributing and creating open source tools, um, you become part of many, many more communities and you see ways that they all fit together. So yeah, it, it's definitely a, 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 a contagious. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've uh, talked a bit about the positives, a, a few of uh, the challenges. I want to ask, you know, what are what are you struggling with in, in or, or what what are the communities that you're involved with uh, struggling with uh, uh, growing pains uh, or, or any kind of anecdotes to share along those lines? Um, so. Um one of the growing pains that Fedora is experiencing is of course with the communities that kind of have cropped up around it. And so how do we meet the needs of Simvera and Islandora while also meeting the needs of those institutions that 
aren't using Simvera and Islandora. Mm. Um, so that is a that is a particular pain point. Um, and so trying to say this is who we are in some respects and then saying to them, you figure out who you are, <laughs> um, I think is, is really a, is a big challenge. Um, especially when you look at the leadership makeup, it's mainly San Vera and Islandora people. So it becomes really hard to have those conversations sometimes and take one hat off and put the other hat on. Um, to be able to kind of draw some of those boundaries around the communities. Um, so I think that's probably our biggest struggle. Um, but in the grand th scheme of things, I think that's a great struggle to have that so many, so many different institutions and com now communities rely on the, the software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Becomes part of the base infrastructure. Yeah. Other thoughts or struggles? So, um, I, I, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that we're going through this governance structure revisioning for Sanvera. And I think that in our case, it's really that we've reached this point where we're a little too big to be governed with the kind of ad hocracy model that we started with. Um, and that switching to a new way of governing ourselves that is both respectful, thoughtful, and built on what we are currently to be flexible enough as we continue to move forward, mm -hmm. I think is really, really important. Um, and I think again, to Rosie's point about kind of where San Vero wants Fedora to go and where Island Dora wants us to go and, and, where, and where other groups may wanna see Fedora going, you know, there is that struggle with, you know, who are we, where are we, what is, how, you know, where does this stack end and where does the other stack begin mm -hmm. um, is, a, is a, an interesting conversation, especially when you're building off of other tools and other communities um, and knowing where that connection point is and sort of where you can take that hat off or where you should take that hat off um, is a really, I think, a, a, a really interesting balancing act for all of us. Um, and I think it's a, it's a hard thing to do. And I think that, that frankly, the governance conversation that we've been having in San Vera is healthy for the community, but it's hard, right? And we, and this is coming quick on the heels of us having to change our name from Hydra to San Vera. Um, and some of the politics that go along with that. I mean, I think that Folio can probably also um, talk about their experience in, in that regard. I mean, I think it's a, that those types of transitions are difficult. They're difficult to talk about. They're difficult to explain to people that are not part of the, the conversation um, and, uh, and can make that, that transition, especially when you're talking to higher level administration at your university or your institution, um, to have them understand what's actually happening and still feel like they can trust what you're working on. Yeah, it takes effort. On the, the technical side for Viewfind, because of our kitchen sink like settings model, the, the product overall is just getting more complex. Mm -hmm. um, the number of people who, are, the number of adoptions that we get that don't, that are non-technical users trying to install it gets less and less as the number of configurations goes up and up mm -hmm. is one of the problems we're having. And while PHP does attract certain people, it is because it's, it's considered an older technology, it does definitely drive some people um, away. So on the technical side, those are two like, things are kind of at odds with each other on the uh, on the organizational side um, we are as I mentioned like we work here at Villanova University and we don't have any other contributions outside of code and like help desk email list volunteers um, but being so closely tied to Villanova is something that we know isn't necessarily a future-proof solution and there's while there's no concerns at all in the immediate future. You know, we've been here for 10 years and there's nothing going away. But finding an institutional home to future-proof you find so that the project continues on for, you know, longer than Villanova University has control over it is something, something that we're certainly looking into, but it comes with a whole slew of challenges because that's mm -hmm. going to add all the complexity that we currently don't have. That's going to add the need for marketing, the need for um, financial contribution, which we currently have no model for, it might cause us to, to tr once again try to do some kind of governance model like m most other open, larger open source projects do have. 
Um, we did make an attempt early on to have a governance system, but it just turned out that we didn't have enough conflict and enough like shareholders like that had different opinions to really need it so mm. we had a governance model and it kind of atrophied away back to two core developers so it's not something that we want to try to force until it's necessary because it's already i don't want to say failed once it was already proved to be unnecessary once mm. Mm -hmm. moving to an institutional home is going to definitely increase the number of shareholders um, and that's going to be a complexity that we need to uh, to work on it to figure out luckily we have so many other communities to look at not only as a model but also to directly collaborate with as far as governance goes so we're not super concerned but it's just definitely something that's ever on the horizon that we want to accomplish sooner rather than later mm -hmm. Um, for Evergreen, I'd say one of our struggles is having more uh, discussions and decision making um, that are strategic, long term strategic decisions in nature. Um, when your roadmap's determined by what someone happens to be working on because it's filling their need, sometimes some of the larger projects or infrastructure improvements get overlooked. And it, it's something the community's working on. We're looking at our annual conference having. Um, annually a time to really talk about strategy and seeing if we can get some of the st stakeholders to step up and um, commit to making some of those uh, strategic improvements happen. Mm. Um, another struggle I would say, um, similar to what Chris was just saying, is um, ease of installation is, we could improve on. I think it's a barrier to adoption. It's um, not easy to uh, install evergreen or even to start working in the code base and part of that leads to some of our other struggles which is you know we, we would love to see more contributors um, if we had you know if it was easier to adopt we'd have more people coming into the community and contributing and also having more vendors we could rely on to help us with development or do some of that work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're getting close to the end time. I uh, don't want to leave on struggles. Uh, what I'd like to leave on is, is what are the, the growth areas uh, for each of the projects that you're affiliated with? Uh, what are you looking forward to? Um, for Fedora, one of the things that we've been working on is establishing a mission and vision, which is actually related to our struggles, right? Because mm -hmm. because of the outgrowth of the Simbera and the Islandora community, having a very clear mission and vision and how we relate to those um, communities will be extremely helpful. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that work. Um, if I weren't on the Simvera governance group, I would go to those meetings every Friday. <laughs> um, because I just, I go to that, um, we have a collaborative document and I love to go to it and see what that group is working on because I wish I could be there too. Mm. Which um, brings me to probably what Aviva is looking forward to. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't think it's going to be a big surprise to anybody to hear that I'm really excited about uh, Samvera actually having a new governance model. Um, it's been a long time coming. It's been a lot of work that we put into it. Um, and I think it will really change the community for the better um, and put us on a, a, a really, you know, we've, we've been on a good path. And I think that sort of where it's going to take us is, is something we're all really excited about. Um, so I, I think we'd all like to see it um, done, and if not, at least, at least, you know, I mean, done in the sort of software sense, right? Like it's good enough for now. We'll we'll come back and keep poking at it. Um, but yeah, that is that is what I'm probably most looking forward to. So with Folio, um, I think we've all been amazed at how much we've been able to accomplish with amicable consensus, giving all the um, different cultures we're working with, um, library, corporate culture, developer culture. Um, of course, what we're for most looking forward to is a, um, a product uh, deliverable next year. And once that 
is out, then yes, there will be major changes in what we want to do, what our priorities will be, what our structure is, and uh, we haven't tackled the the post-release um, issues yet. Looking forward to the post-release issues, maybe. Yes. Uh, Viewfind has um, a new major release coming out this summer, 5.0. Mm. Um, which is which we're excited about because we are using a lot of shiny new features in the latest version of Zen frameworks that just came out and the newest uh, version of PHP that just came out to kind of handle some of the complexity going forward. And we're very excited to be working with the developers of the Alma and the Folio um, drivers, um, ILS, ILSs that we're, we're going to have support for all for all the modern ILS systems that are coming out. The open source ones and uh, that's very exciting to have those features in place and to work with those communities um, so 5.0 is coming out this summer um, if you're interested in viewfind feel free to come to the summit or check out our dev calls there's things happening all the time excellent good plug yes and for evergreen i'd say we just finished up a multi-year project to move to a new staff client oh, yes. um, which was released in the fall and it's no longer a downloadable client it's something you can use from the uh, browser and this year is when we're starting to roll it out to more libraries in production and it's just a beautiful client and I think it's going to change the way people work with Evergreen and we're ex excited to roll it out to our libraries and see how they work with it and, and I think they're excited about it too. Big accomplishment there yes. Uh, any closing thoughts uh, from our panelists? One last shot. All right. Uh, this concludes today's forum on a peek inside open source communities. You can continue the conversation at the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org, on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forums, uh, and certainly in the communities that were represented here today. The recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the openlibraryenvironment.org website and the Olay channel. If you have feedback on this forum or an idea for a future forum, please contact the Folio Forum facilitators at facilitators at olay-lists.openlibraryfoundation.org. Uh, thank you to uh, Michael Winkler, who was my technical support behind the scenes. Uh, I also want to thank our panelists uh, who uh, graciously gave of their time uh, and experience. Uh, Paula, Aviva, Rosie, Chris, and Kathy, uh, thank you for uh, sharing your experience with us. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll call to a close. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Peter. Everyone.